Let us now see some of the definitions in the Wealth Tax Act. These definitions, just like any other case, are very important because these are going to form the basis of further understanding that you will be gaining throughout the concept of wealth tax. The first one to start with is the valuation date. Now I know we discussed this a little bit earlier where I gave you an example but just for the sake of completeness let's see valuation date means March 31 immediately preceding the assessment year. So if the assessment year is 2011 2012 right that will commence from 1st April 2011 and therefore March 31 immediately preceding the assessment year will be March 31 of 2011. So that is to be considered as the valuation date. So the March 31 immediately preceding the assessment year is the valuation date. Now net wealth as on the last moment is to be considered for valuation purposes. Now what does this mean? What will happen here is that 31st March will itself comprise from 12.01 am until 11.59 pm. So it's the last moment at which you will be considering whether the person is the owner of the asset or not to see whether this particular thing is chargeable to wealth tax or not. If he sells it somewhere between this time, then it is assumed that on the valuation date, the asset does not belong to assessing. So it has to be on the last moment that the assessee should own the asset. The asset should belong to the assessee. Then the next one is incidence of wealth tax. Now you must have studied in your inter examinations of CA which are known as IPCC that the wealth tax or rather the income tax depends on residential status. Similarly even the incidence of wealth tax depends on the residential status of the individual HUF and the company. Okay. Now how this impact each one of them we are going to see in detail but in so far as your incidence is concerned that is affected by the residential status of various category of people. The third one is location of the asset. Now you have seen that when you compute wealth tax you take the assets and you subtract the liabilities. Okay. So what is it? I mean which all liabilities are to be excluded? Which all are assets are to be included? It's very important. So there are general rules regarding which assets are to be included depending on the residential status. Okay. Now location of asset is a matter of fact. I mean if an asset is in India, it is in India. You can't say that it is lying outside. It's a matter of fact. It's a fact whether the asset is lying in India or not. And is to be decided based on the available evidence. Right? So whatever evidence is available, you consider that evidence to see whether an asset lies in India or it does not lie in India. Right? Some of the general principles which have been provided and have been laid down by certain judicial precedents are as under. Tangible immovable property. So an immovable property which is situated in India lies in India. Again, rights, interest in immovable property lies in India. Ships and aircraft will lie in India only when they are registered in India. Debts contracted in India means 
if there is an agreement which is signed between the lender and the company which is taking it if the contract is signed in India then it is said that the debt lies in India or the debtor which is the company in this case resides in India. Goods in transit on high seas and destined to India they are assumed to be lying outside India. This is the case when let's say if you have a foreign jurisdiction there are goods which move to India and then they are currently on high seas but they are supposed to come to India even in such a case they are treated as being lying outside India. Okay.